speakers, the first two speakers, to all the participants in this conference, to our conference. And what's special is that this is the first conference we are doing entirely uh, via, uh, you know, a web platform. It's a webinar rather than a live conference. And that is because of the conditions that we are under this COVID-19 pandemic. So apologies in advance. We would have liked to see all of you here in Shimla. And that was our plan. We postponed the conference a couple of times. But finally, we thought that we should go ahead. We can't be waiting indefinitely, either for the pandemic to pass or for the vaccine to be invented, whichever came first. So under these circumstances, I welcome all of you. And I also welcome our fellows who have joined us. Uh, there'll be a few housekeeping announcements to begin with. Uh, the first of which is we need to mute our mics when we are not speaking, because otherwise there'll be a background sound. And I also want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, the first is uh, uh, to ask our fellows if, uh, uh, you know, if we should meet in person with social distancing, since there are very few of us. So this is the हम लोगों के चर्चा में आई थी तो प्लीज आप लोग सोच लीजिए मेरे पास एक चिट्ठी भी आई है हमारे कन्वीनर साहब प्रोफेसर राजवीर शर्मा जी ने मुझे एक चिट्ठी लिखी है कि क्यों नहीं हम लोग सेमिनार हॉल में दोबारा मिलते हैं तो आप लोग प्लीज इसके बारे में सोचिए और यह अनिवार्य नहीं होगा यह स्वेच्छा से होगा अगर आप घर से ज्वाइन करना चाहें तो भी बढ़िया है जिन लोगों को आना है because a lot of people are feeling there is a bit of a, uh, artificiality about the way we are communicating through this WebEx. So uh, please think about it. That's the first announcement. The other announcement is a very happy one. I don't know if all of you can see this book. Yes, yes, you can see it. Yes, yes, yes. Metaphysics okay. consciousness. Exactly. Yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's a new book, and it's by a former fellow of IIA, it's a former national fellow, Professor Ramesh Chandra Pradhan. And wow. it's called Metaphysics wow. of Consciousness, the Indian Vedantic Perspective. It has just come out. Springer has published it. It's a very well-produced volume. Uh, this was the work he did here when he was the national fellow. So we congratulate him, and uh, we wish this book all the best in its journey into the world. I had occasion to uh, read into part of this manuscript uh, after the reports came in, because when we were sending it out uh, to spring, uh, I had a look at it. We also uh, got it uh, reviewed from uh, not once, but actually twice. Once Springer got it reviewed, and then we, were, we originally reviewed it uh, through IIS. It's a blind peer, peer review system. Uh, Double blind, and the review was very positive and very detailed. Bahut lamba review aaya tha, and it was sent to a very eminent contemporary philosopher in India. Uh, so we are very proud that this book has come out. So once again, those who know uh, Professor Khan can convey to him how we released the book at the beginning of our wonderful uh, event, which is River in the literary traditions of India, or we should say rivers in the literary tradition of India, to make it plural, or we'll have to say the river in the literary traditions of India. Now, I think the court can choose as far as the nomenclature is concerned. But before uh, I invite Arzubanji to tell us a few things about this con uh, conference, its concept note, I, I also had a few reflections of my own, if you don't mind. Uh, in fact, uh, just yesterday, I saw the concept note. I began to think about this uh, uh, a little bit in my mind. And uh, I was actually, uh, you know, reminded of uh, these verses of the Rig Veda. I think they appear in the first mandala in the 35, in hymn number 35. It says, Ashtam Vaya Akhyata Kukubhat. That's what I wanted to uh, focus on, the Sapta Sindhun idea. 
हिण्याक्ष कविता देव रत्ना दाशुते कार्याणी सो दिस दिस यू सी आई आई डिड अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ रिसर्च एंड इट सीम्स दैट देर आर एटलीस्ट थर्टी फाइव रेफरेंसेस टू द सरस्वती रिवर इन द ऋग्वेदा and uh, the point that i'm really trying to make uh, is that india is a riverine civilization this is the point that came to my mind and then it also occurred to me that the ancient civilizations you know uh some of the prominent ancient civilizations were also riverine for example uh, the nile civilization you know the ancient egyptian civilization which was also magnificent if you've been to uh you know uh, the pyramids near cairo and then to memphis and some of those parts of ancient egypt which i've had occasion to go to it's just stunning and the and the burial chambers the kind of art they had very very highly developed civilizations going back to uh, 3000 years before the current era you know the earliest uh, pyramids go back to that time and then the 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 civilization of mesopotamia right in the rivers tigris and euphrates another very ancient civilization the code of hammurabi and then you move further we're moving east if you notice how i'm uh, doing a survey so to speak of the ancient world the axial age it was called and then you come to the sindhu saraswati civilization we'll we'll not go into the controversies about uh you know the uh, these ancient people whether they were indigenous whether they uh went from india you know to persia and elsewhere whether they came to india and when the migrations happened whether they happened 12000 years ago or 40000 years ago or 30000 years ago and what the genetic details are we won't go into that but of course we have a uh, eminent uh, archaeologist with us professor bhan who has worked on the harappan civilization and uh, he is uh, in his presentations and in his research he has shown us the material artifacts of that civilization the manufacturing techniques uh, the transmission and the spread of the civilization so it was very widespread much more widespread than uh, alexander cunningham originally thought harappa and, and mohenjodaro it's much much more widespread not only rakhi gadi but you know it spread over a very large area and move further east and you go to the yellow river of uh, china uh, and again it's a riverine civilization and subsequently any other great civilizations were by the rivers by the mekong river for example if you go to angkor wat and tanjore and you see the brihadeshwara temple and let's not forget that the taj was also built on the banks of the yamuna so, so the, the point i'm trying to make is that this is our first uh, annual uh, integration conference national integration conference uh it's actually mandated in our memorandum of understand uh, of association and uh we are supposed to hold such a conference every year but for years and years no such conference was held and then there was uh, an idea that we should uh hold this conference thinking about our rivers because rivers in india represent not just literature right but they represent commerce art culture crafts uh and in a sense rivers are living entities right they and they they, they represent ecological cultures they represent uh, you know our water bodies uh they 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 foreground issues of floods uh of climate change uh, the kosi river for example uh, you know changes its course every year causing so much destruction and uh, the floods Uh, that happen uh, and then the parched land and then you know the the plans of interconnecting our rivers so what i'm trying to say is the river is a resonant symbol in india 
going back to the Sapta Sindhus from which we get our name, uh, India, Indicos, Hindu, Hindustan. So it is a riverine civilization which is defined in a sense by its rivers. And the concept note talks about the Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb as we know it in North India. But uh, we shouldn't forget the Sapta Sindhus uh, uh, and then the Brahmaputra which is the largest river in India, actually. It's not the Ganga in terms of the amount of water, you know, that is, uh, uh, the, the, that is carried uh, from the Tibetan uh, plateau, uh, you know, uh, to the Bay of Bengal. It is Brahmaputra, which is, a, which is India's largest water body. So let's not forget that. And then let's not forget Narmada uh, and Kaveri and, and uh, those magnificent rivers south of the Vindhyas. And I think the concept note quotes uh, from the Brahan Naradiya Puran. And, uh, you know, I, my mother uh, chants this every morning before she takes her bath. Gange uh, Chayamune Chaiva Godavari Saraswati Narmade Sindhukaveri Jalasmen Sannadham Kurum. So this is a riverine civilization uh, where are rivers which do not necessarily obey state boundaries, regional boundaries, linguistic boundaries, cultural boundaries. I mean, th things that divide us, things that separate us. Rivers, uh, you know, actually transcend these. We had a wonderful conference on the, on the Nishadas, river communities, you know, and what's happened to these river communities in India, uh, how they've been degraded and they're, they're in a struggle for survival. So, uh, I thought that uh, Dr. Ara's idea of literary cultures around the rivers of India was a wonderful theme for a national integration conference. Uh, so uh, uh, what the rivers represent in India, I'm, I'm reminded of a wonderful book by Sri Aurobindo called The Secret of the Veda, uh, where he says that the, the primary theme of the Vedas is... Uh, Actually, the, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, it's a struggle over water. That's what he says, partly. And uh, uh, there's a struggle over water between, uh, you know, these uh, two groups of people. So, uh, Vritra, Vritra, you know, literally means like an obstacle. This is in the Yajurveda, of course, that there's a battle between Indra and, and Vritra over the liberation of the waters, you know, this is, this is such a beautiful uh, myth, as it were, if you want to use it as a myth, but it's a, I would call it the Ur story of India. Uh, what happens in this myth, there's another variant of the myth where the cows, and of course the word go in the Vedas has 65 meanings or more, and these, uh, these cows are, are captured by the Panis and are uh, hidden in the Vala cave. And actually there is a hound, there's a female hound of Indra uh, uh, who leads Indra to these cows. So it's a, it's a beautiful story. And uh, in fact, if I remember right, uh, um, one of our uh, um, Radhakrishnan memorial speakers, uh, Dr. Bibek Debra has actually written a book on uh, uh, you know, the canines of India, I mean, the dogs and the Vedas and so forth. It's a, it's a wonderful essay on the hounds of heaven, so to speak. So these, uh, it's, it's, uh, these heavenly uh, dogs, they lead Indra to the captured cows, which, which may be a symbol of capturing the waters. And the liberation of the waters is to me, uh, uh, you know, a symbol of the liberation of knowledge as well. So these waters are life-giving, they fertilize the earth, uh, they quicken the crops, and they also represent, uh, as does the idea of Saraswati, the one who flows, you know, and it's also the goddess of learning, you know, the one who flows, and uh, it's a flow which also opens up the mind, you know. Uh, so this is, this is a wonderful topic, and uh, I think that we will benefit immensely from this. I hope there's a volume that comes out which should be dedicated to Professor Kailash Baral for all the work he's done and, uh, and by his student, Dr. Arzumanara. I think 
that is the aspiration with which we want to embark on this uh, conference. And I hope that uh, all the good energies support us in our noble endeavor when we speak about and celebrate the waters of India, the waters of life, uh, which inspire and, and, uh, and, uh, and take us towards the light. So with these few words, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Arzuman Ara to please uh, uh, take it forward. Tell us a little bit about the conference, about the participants, uh, uh, about the different people who are participating, and how, how in a way, uh, this is a good theme uh, for Bharat Jodo rather than Bharat Todo, uh, you know, we respect difference, we respect uh, dissent, we respect uh, diversity. But once again, since I'm on Sri Aurobindo just now, I, I always remember what Sri Aurobindo said, that diversity doesn't lead to unity, you know. Actually, di unity expresses itself in diversity, okay. So, uh, uh, e pluribus unum, the great, sim uh, the great uh, slogan of America, actually means that you're losing your individuality. That is the melting pot. Then you get amalgamated, right? Or the salad bowl. You know, sometimes the Canadian uh, model of multiculturalism is called the salad bowl. So what happens in the salad bowl? Everything gets tossed, all the ingredients are mixed, but the lettuce remains the lettuce, the capsicum remains the capsicum, the cucumber remains the cucumber, but they take the flavor of each other. Other people have used the idea of the mosaic, which goes back to the Byzantine Empire. But I think the idea, I think what Shorbindo is really saying is, is very interesting because, again, it's ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti. In other words, unity expresses itself in a variety of ways without using losing its distinction, without losing its individuality, and without losing its connection with the whole. You know, and why, why am I going back to this? Because when we talk about, in, you know, the integral, I just want to mention, take a word to talk about the integral. Yesterday, we had a wonderful conference uh, by one of our seminar, by one of our fellows on uh, deontic logic. And uh, also, you know, uh, it, it leads to deontology, which is, uh, which is uh, a school of ethics, which is usually seen as opposed to consequentialism. But one of the things that came up again and again, at least in my mind, is that rationality alone does not lead to ethics. You see, there's something for us to think about. So reason alone perhaps doesn't lead us to truth. And that's why we need, you know, the flow of intuition, the flow of illumination. I use the flow because uh, you know, the rigid structures of land, the rigid continental structures with their hierarchies actually divide us and close us up into compartments. And the integral means that we have to bring wisdom and compassion together, not reason alone, you know. So the integral is a way of thinking which combines the different faculties of the human uh, spirit. And it is only in the spirit that the integral can manifest, you know, not in reason alone. That's my point, not in reason alone, not in action alone, not in emotion alone. You know, all these, uh, you know, divergences, all these dualities are what rivers, uh, uh, you know, challenge us to overcome. And, and, uh, and uh, the flow of the river, you know, is not fixed. It's, uh, you know, every moment the river changes, and yet it remains the same. You know, from Gangotri to Ganga Sagar, is it one Ganga? Notionally it is. And yet, every minute Ganga is changing. So, you know, this represents to me, uh, you know, the complexity of uh, India's notion of identity, which is not based on fixity and rigidity, but it is based on of evolutionary flow. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not something that is oppressive and divisive. And, and yet, it's not merely a flow uh, without, uh, without a continuity. So the point is, it is the same Ganga from, from Gangotri 
to Ganga Sagar. And yet every point of this Ganga is different. Where it meets the Bhagirathi, it's different. At Haridwar, it's different. In Banaras, it's different. Where they say it's the Ulti Ganga, because it takes you back to your source, you see. So the, the idea of the river as a symbol, you know, to bring us together, you know, without losing our difference, without where we can celebrate our difference, because every region of India is different. And it's worth celebrating this diversity, you know. Uh, and yet, and yet, uh, the nation, the idea of the nation, which is, which is cultural, geocultural, geospiritual, uh, not, not the idea of the state, okay, but the idea of a nation, which is a common uh, civilizational and cultural code, that nation is knit together by the sacred geography of the mountains, of the rivers, you know, and of the land uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we call the land of the Sapta Sindhus. Okay, so so once again, thank you all, and uh, and welcome to this conference. And now, Dr. Ara will lead us uh, through this first session, uh, and also tell us a bit about the conference itself. Please go. Ahead. We must also, uh, you know, uh, yes, please, now we can see you again. I'm saying there'll be some connectivity issues and we'll have to, uh, I think, bear with it. And uh, my, my simple suggestion is if you're having a connectivity problem, you can switch off your video so that we can still hear you and we can move ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Ara, please. I think we, we are having a bit of a connectivity issue. Can you all hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Maybe, maybe I, can, I can request Professor Baral to please uh, uh, take over from here and we'll come back to we'll come back to Dr. Ara after after. I'm going to mute my mic. Okay. Person, I have to unmute your mic. It's okay now? Yeah. Yeah. Here, Professor Paranjape, uh, Director of Akans Institute, fellows at the Institute, and my senior, Professor Kaldas Mishra, Vijay and uh, participants. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Paranjabe has uh, almost covered whatever I was going to present, <laughs> almost covered half of it. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is his style <laughs> with his encyclopedic information and uh, love of his own voice. He keeps on talking, but very informative. Nonetheless, uh, uh, I feel uh, honored that the volume that he proposed to bring uh, will be dedicated to me. Thank you very much, Professor Paranjape. This is a rare honor. Uh, actually, my topic uh, for this webinar is River Sutra, Poetics of River, Popular Culture, and Bhupen, Bhupen Hajarika's River Songs. India has sustained itself as one of the remarkable river civilizations over thousands of years. The civilizational significance is crucial to India's cultural life that has remained uninterrupted in spite of historically powerful forces held sway over the subcontinent. 
the very identity of India, that is Bharat Barsha, is often contested and questioned. And it is questioned of its a territorial boundary, cultural geography, and the traditions articulated as it were in diverse cultural signatures. The answer to all these motivated questions lies in the evidence of an integrated cultural geography that India was and is, and it may be obtained from Puranas and other cultural texts. In a Vishnu Purana, it is said, uh, Uttaram Yata Samudrayasya Himadrashaschaiva Dakhinam Varsam Tad Bharatam Nama Bharati Yatra Santi Santatihi. This verse in English translation means the country situated to the north of the sea and the south of the Himalayas is known as Bharat and its progeny known as Bharati. If the sea and the Himalayas constitute India's, India's outside boundary, the rivers of India underline its internal interconnected cultural life. The land of Bharat is broadly constituted of river valleys, that has already been said, in that rivers have remained inalienable part of our cultural life from time immemorial. As an entity of nature, rivers in India remained the source of our ritual, spiritual, material, cultural aspirations, transcending time and space. And the As the Ganges flows down from a mythic past to an eternity yet to arrive. Besides, the livelihood of many communities across the geography of India is dependent on rivers. Witness to time and history, rivers in India speak to us and are spoken about by poets, geographers, historians, archaeologists, pilgrims, and so on, making them living entities. The primacy of rivers in Indian cultural life has been scripted in the Vedas, and one of the citation has already been given. The Vedas refer to 21 rivers. Rai Varman. Mute karo. The Vedas refer to 21 rivers of India, among them the river Saraswati. I will not go into that because Professor uh, Paranjepe has already said about it, but I will just refer to it that uh, this particular Saraswati civilization was important because the river connected the Ganges and the Kabul River in Afghanistan. Therefore, you can look at that this is a river which went towards the west of India and connected uh, the central, uh, you know, Ganga Jamuna plains with Kabul. Uh, see, in a Nadi Shukta of Rig Veda, it is said, all this is verily waters, the elements of the universe, the vital airs, and living things, indeed food, immortality, sovereignty, the godheads, the hymns, the judges, the light, the truth, all the deities, and the three planes are all indeed the waters. And this particular reference could be connected to, you know, liberating water, as Professor Paranjape was talking about. Rivers as water bodies are acknowledged as tattva, or a body of knowledge, as they include three planes, elements of the universe, including divine and human, and all living things along with the light, the truth, the hymns, and also all that are reviled. It, is also, it also takes the vestas on its body. Water is linked to Panchabhutas, one of the elements that is that the human body is constituted of, that is actually water. Like air, water is the very source of life, but it makes human existence possible on the land. This is the preliminary kind of thing. I have talked about the river and India, or the river in Indian cultural life. Now I come to my topic, that if you uh, Hard correctly the first part of my 
topic is river sutra i am indeed indebted to gita mehta for c in depicting the life of river namada has uh, underlined the interconnectedness of uh, diverse indian spiritual and cultural practices in her work river sutra that is that was published 1993 the first part of the title of my paper is inspired by her work to underline diversity of indian cultural life held together by rivers in a deeper way rivers in india are symbolic of our composite culture and cultural consciousness that could be constituted into a poetics of river rivers in constant flow representing ups and downs evinced in tide and ebb or surge and recede resonating in the very character of this entity remind us constantly the transitoriness of a human life the banks of a river uh, symbolize the limits of human action holding forth a normative code not to cross the boundaries thereby not dominating or violating laws of nature or dharma in its flow it always symbolizes our spiritual aspirations and connectedness across territories to an indivisible indivisible humanity the river as an entity of nature is considered sacred in our cultural imaginary as mehta mentions bathing in the rivers of jamuna purifies a man in 7 days in the waters of saraswati in 3 in the waters of ganges in 1 but the narmada purifies with a single sight of her waters salutations to the o narmada the purifying ability of a river is invested with the fact that rivers wash away all our sins further the waters of the seven sacred rivers are collected to undertake important rituals and pujas that is uh, that is what has been said already sapta sindhu uh, <clears throat> see there are a lot of uh, shrines also on the banks of uh, famous rivers in india with lavish sprays on these rivers and uh, you will find that it is a very complex kind of uh, arrangement a poetic imagination pilgrimage you know people moving and at the same time different other kind of things that happens with the river as well as the river at the center of all those things you talk about rituals you talk about shraddha and all those things you know there are so many it is a complex kind of arrangement when we talk about rivers in india as a waterways rivers have sustained trade and commerce for ages and even death rituals on the banks of these rivers and immersion of ashes into their rivers or into their waters are believed by the hindus to allow a peaceable passage to the dead uh, to the dead to the kingdom of the divine from birth to death rivers in india have sustained human life in their manifold magic ganga ascha jamuna ascha that is already this shloka has been recited by professor ranjepe uh, therefore what i am trying to emphasize here that when you uh, closely look at indian cultural thinking or thought we never actually talk about death of a river you see in 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 india in indian cultural thinking rivers are perpetually alive they never die they may disappear they may disappear for a while but they never die uh, a river may disappear but cannot die it is kept alive for our cultural continuity whether a legendary river or a small local one like rajaraos himavat abounding kanthapura all rivers of india are born of legends constituted into human life cycles reified and woven into a robust cultural imaginary this is the most significant thing about indian culture and rivers now i come to poetics of river the above the instances underline a cultural poetics that provides an understanding how rivers are inseparable part of life in india there is a structure of thought that broadens into our understanding of the 
relation between nature and culture. As an entity of nature, rivers have always seized upon human imagination. River poems from all cultures attribute human characteristics to rivers, having deep moments of reflection on human existence. Henry Longfellow aptly writes, Thou hast taught me silent river, many a nation, deep and long. Thou hast been a generous giver, I can give thee but a song. From Longfellow's ruminations to the romantic association of Coleridge with the river of his childhood in his sonnet to the river Otter, to the famous line of Spencer's sweet Thames run subtly till I end my song, we are testimony to the fact that river is a symbol of life and human activity as in Whitman's crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Rhetorical allusions to life as a river are a plenty mostly underlining passes of time with ups and downs. In Whitman's words, flow on river, flow with the flood tide and eve, with the eve tide drench with your splendor me, or the men and women generations after me. Further, in a meditative moment, he asks, what is then between us? What is the count of hundreds of years between us? Whatever it is, it avails not distance, avails not, and a place avails not. Whitman's reflections on the relation between man and river go beyond time and space. A time and space constitute the cornerstone of a poetics of a river. In that symbolism, human existence, spirituality, and so on are woven into normative practices, practices while going beyond. A poetics of river from India, from Indian perspective, constitutes an inclusive sociology of life based on equality and free will. For a river doesn't deny anyone who wants its water and use of it in any form while allowing exploitation of its resources for human livelihood. Further, rivers also represent a strong sense of cultural and natural ecology with spiritual aspirations in this life and beyond. Rabindranath Tagore re-emphasizes this very thought in the following lines in his poem, Janmadin. This life of minds being nurtured by a river, in its arteries flow the gifts of a mountain peaks, its fields have been saved by many alluvial layers, mysterious vital juices from diverse sources have spread themselves in harvests upon harvests from the east and west networks of song streams, lull its sleep and awake. Tagore's reflections elevates the thought on a physical river to a sublime state of a song streams. Nadi, sorry, Nadi like Nadi constitutes metaphorically the arteries in human body and in the alluvial soil of the heart, it nurtures songs of a man in love, joy, sorrow, and gives rise to an aspiration to immortalize mortality. Human mind is like a river. When turbulent, it is difficult to predict, but when it is calm, things look clear. Emily Dickinson's poem, My River Runs to Thee, explains the very dharma of a river running to meet the sea that may be alluded to life flowing to meet the divine, the paramatma, like a lover or a devotee. The poetics of a river seem to be a link between the, between the eternal and the earthly transients. Now I come to the last part of my paper, River and Popular Culture, Bhupen Hajarika's Mahabahu Brahmaputra. Apart from Sastras, the Sutras, the Romances, the ritual representations with the canonical and non-canonical resonances, rivers in India have been a source of folklore and popular culture. There are songs composed from time immemorial to signify life on the banks of rivers. There are films made representing the river Ganges and many documentaries being to bear on how the diversity of a cultural life pans out on the banks of the river. 
The River Ganges has been an inspiration for many Bollywood films such as Jis Desh Me Ganga Bhakti Hai, Ganga Teri Pani Amrit, Ganga Ki Saugand, etc. Jis Desh Me Ganga Bhakti Hai, Ham Us Desh Ki Basi Hai has been a classic song that defines our identity as Indians represented through the River Ganges. There are many documentaries made on most of the rivers of India, including many on the River Ganges. Popular culture, as defined by Oxford Dictionary, is a set of practices, beliefs, and objects that embody the most broadly shared meanings of a social system. River literature across the boat come under popular culture most folk songs are inspired by the rivers in eastern and northeast India. There is a genre of river songs from Bengal and Bangladesh called Bhatiali, famous for their resonances and reflective moods, having generated many conversations on life. Outside this folk tradition, there are popular singers who have composed the song, composed and sung river songs. In the context of my presentation, I shall discuss river songs of the legendary singer Bhupen Hajarika, who comes from Assam. Hajarika's Mahabahu Brahmaputra. Not only Brahmaputra, but songs on Ganga, Padda. From his uh, bio note. Uh, so his, uh, he has done his doctoral research on the war novel in America. Then he has been a postdoctoral Fulbright Fellow at uh, uh, University of La Salle, Philadelphia, and Colorado State University in Americas. And then he was also Shastri Indo Canadian Faculty Research Fellow at the University of Manitoba in Canada. Uh, later, he was associated with Orissa Research Project of the German uh, Research Council, University of Heidelberg, Germany, where he collaborated uh, on the translation of poems of Bhima Boy, the 19th century Oriya poet, and that was published uh, by Manohar in um, 2010. Uh, and the work uh, appeared as Bhima Boy, Verses from the Void. Uh, and this was edited by Bettina Boimer and Johannes uh, Belts. His articles and poems have uh, appeared in international journals. Um, and uh, uh, I welcome him. Uh, please welcome. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your introduction. And uh, I see the time. It is now 4.30. After 10 minutes, there will be a break. Uh, can we take some of the questions for 10 minutes? Then we can come back. Will that be OK? I think uh, we have very little time. and. Our so let me let me go for 10 minutes then after i will be switching on the next you no know, link and then i'll come back again you know because it takes time there will be an interruption after as uh, you know i see it uh, there in the screen and uh, thank you very much uh, for this introduction, and I thank Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Professor Paranjape, and all the organizers uh, for organizing this webinar. And my presentation will be, am I audible? Yes. Hello? Yes, sir, you are audible. Am I? Yeah. Uh, my presentation will be the river tradition uh, with special reference to Odia literature. And I'll, as a set of uh, comparison, I'll be bringing some of the American texts, you know, in the. Uh, but let me begin with uh, a 15th century Odia poet, Sara Das, Shudra poet you know, known for his rendering of the Mahabharata. And uh, they said that it is a unique work. 
and there in his mahabharata there is an episode just before the end of uh, the mahabharata war durjodhan was to cross a river of blood and uh, this durjodhan was trying to swim through a river of blood you know to go to the other side and uh, he found that the dead bodies the corpses of the soldiers who had uh, died in the war they were floating and in desperation when he was trying to catch trying to go across the river of blood he was trying to catch at some sort of a last straw you know catching the dead bodies but all were sinking you know he was unable to you know catch hold of any particular you know dead body that would be perhaps carrying him to the other uh, side to the other side and at last there was one cops that could uh, make him to the river and when he reached the other side he found out that that was the cops of his own son as if the son when he was alive had invested everything you know all his Uh, tapas, all his good work, all his good deeds, and that came in help as a marker of hope for the father. You know, and this river of blood, and sometimes uh, it is very much linked up to the river of hope. You know, Asa Baitarani, and Saladas was telling about that. so i begin with that because instead of talking about uh, the ganges instead of talking about or the other rivers saradas in his own unique way refers to you know the river that is very much there in odisha and he tries to you know graft the orian life orian lifestyle on the river you know into the man you know the fabric of uh, the mahabharat itself coming back to another 19th century adivasi poet kondho poet bima hoy um, he lived uh, during 1845 to 1895 uh, lived during 1845 in uh, through 1895 when it came to you know in most of his poems you know he refers to river mahanadi you know mahanadi the great river you know that passes through odisha and uh, he swears by the river the water of river mahanadi in one of the poems he says that instead of swearing usually when it comes to swearing when you come to take oath when you take try to testify yourself you touch the water of ganges in many of the houses you know south india will be you know uh, the water from ganges in bottles and in other containers you know we we swear and we take oath by the water of ganges but bima hoy he says that if whatever i am telling it is wrong if you say that it is not true then i swear by the water of by touching the water of bahanadi that that sort of uh, a sort of uh, sanctity that this particular poet had for uh, river bahanadi you know as a river of purity sanctity you know as a river that you know can always stand as a set of example and um, he did that this rebel poet you know who was very much against casteism against all sorts of uh, uh, say um, differences in terms of caste or creed or color you know ultimately um, you know made uh, live you know by the river mahanadi 
the last 18 years of his life was spent uh, in a little village by the river Mahanadi. And um, Mahanadi was a source of strength, a source of uh, livelihood, and also a, an example by which you can live. And um, coming back, because uh, from Grimavoy, if you are coming to another 19th century, say early 20th century poet, uh, my Dr. Mayadhar Mansingh, you know, Dr. Mayadhar Mansingh, uh, you know, was born in 1905 and he lived till 1972 and um, 73, sorry. He has this beautiful poem, Moonlit Ride in the River Mahanadi. Instead of saying that it is a boat ride, he says it is a moonlit night, moonlit ride, riding, you know, on the moonlight. And um, on one particular full moon night, you know, he had this ride, boat ride, in the river Mahanadi. And that was the occasion. And beautiful descriptions. River, in a way, was at its best, you know, with, in all its resplendent beauty, in all its splendor. Nature was at its best, silvery moon, and, and it was a cool, breezy, moonlight night. And the river, you know, in a way, was the occasion to remind him of the glorious past of Orisha. You know, that particular moment was so very nostalgic that he was remembering the glorious past of Orisha, and he was trying to compare, you know, with the then condition, how come you have become? He was addressing Odisha, his own state, and he's telling Mother Odisha, how come you have become so very improvised? How come you have become so very poor? Once upon a time, you were rich, you know, you had a rich martial tradition. How come you have become poor, improvised, you have become weak, and you have lost all your glory? And uh, the description goes on, and um, that particular poem is about the river Vahanadi and also about Orissa's past, Orissa's glorious past, and how, in the process of living, the Odias had lost their sense of valor, their sense of identity, and they were very much languishing. And then he says that life, he, he'll, he'll have to go back. You know, it is not that he'll be staying. The river was trying to give him some consolation, some solace, some sort of uh, stay against uh, the confusion and chaos of life surrounding him. Still then, still then, he was trying to uh, suggest that I'll have to go back. Should I go back? And before going back, he had this, you know, uh, typical, say, mystical experience. And there, at the heart of the river, you know, he experiences something that was very much divine. You know, River Mahanadi woke him up to his past, made him conscious of the present, and also afford him something in some sort of spiritual rejuvenation, spiritual regeneration. He had a set of direct, you know, wordless communication with the divine. You know, and this will be telling you about one part of Orisha, you know, one part of Orisha at a particular moment in time. And perhaps Mahadhar Mansing was saying that that river is slowly you know, dying, that river, you know, as a source of inspiration, source of spiritual solace, source of um, identity, you know, it is slowly dying. And if you come back, you know, to another poet, Joint Mahapatra, you know, this is taking in, in
sitting by the river she was reminded of all those people who were dead who were gone and river was reminding him of his own past not glorious past the past that is over and the people who are gone and it is a sad river not silvery beautiful splendid river like that of mansing it is a sad river river of sadness mournful river and moonlight moonlight is falling you know mahadhar mansing when he was describing mahanadi he was telling mahanadi in a moonlit night he was describing that it is very much like a liquid mirror liquid silvery mirror now jain mahapatra says the river is very much falling the moonlight is falling unsteadily uncertain light not sure uncertain light mournful wind unsteady moonlight and there are temple chanting very loudly there is a fisherman community in a poor fisherman community living in their sex so it was a mournful picture picture of sadness picture of poverty and picture of uncertainty picture of not chaos sadness and picture of very much uh, say um, a life uh, that is very much um, unlike that we find in mahadev Man- man singh no 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 question of Mahatma Man Singh will be talking about the maritime culture of Odisha. How, at one point of time, you know, um, people from Odisha will be going to far off lands for business. Now, that is that. You know, you you are reminded of a line from Yes Eliot. You know, the names are departed from the river. You know, that mystic of the river is gone. You know, river. You know. Elsewhere says river sweat soil and tar instead of you know all the you know mystic all the hoary mythopoeic you know kind of thing that we associate river is a bad river mournful river sad river without any mystic without any you know hello uh, say profile it is rather a picture of poverty. very much and because the wind speaks up sadness the lights moonlight speaks up sadness the river speaks up sadness and th- th- there is no question of any uh, anything in terms of a of an anchor to support you know you are not talking about the cool breezy wind you are not talking about uh, uh, the romantic uh, you know fiber you know n- nothing of that sort so bleak picture of a uh, life that you get unlike you know this sort of exuberant you know life that we get when you are coming to uh, a poem by mahadhar mansing so mahadhar mansing and um, john these two and if you are bringing in bima hoy 19th century poet na bima and you go back to sala das you know just uh, i am try- trying to and when you come to the modern day poets young poets there you get you know it it, it is a set of diverse profile modern day poets uh, like kedar misra like bharat maji like uh, you know i am not going to uh, you know give detailed you know account of you know this but the picture that you get is that because of deforestation because of industrialization you know the river has lost its you know purity you know and people are very much struggling hard the lifeline has been cut and mahanadi is very much in the grip of it's a struggle between two states odisha and chatisgarh uh, and um, because of uh, um industrialization because of the big dream project and so many things are happening and uh, no more you know the names are there no more the mahmets are not there the fairies never come to the bank of the river or you are never thinking of the river in terms of an anchor in terms of a mythopoeic anchor and keeping that in mind 
you know, when I go back to some of the American texts, you know, think of uh, think of uh, Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain's famous, you know, uh, novel. You know, very much, uh, or his life on the Mississippi. You know, there Mississippi is very much a set of expansive frontier of freedom, exuberance. You know, and whatever was happening, all the corruption, all the shady deals, all the dart, all the filth are there on the bank. All the hypocrisy, all the stupidities, all the indignities are on the bank. The river is pure. You know, if you come down, so river as a wild, you know, wide, expansive frontier of freedom and exuberance. You come to a writer like Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway wrote uh, beautifully, he wrote that famous story in two parts, the big two-hearted river. So there, the river is very much, inter the river had a physical frontier, physical space, but river will be also giving you redemption. You know, it is two-hearted because it will be giving you sustenance, it will be giving you fish. Also, it will be giving you emotional, spiritual consolation in terms of redemption. It will be redeeming you. You know, Nick Adams, after the war, after experiencing the ravages of war, when it is trying to accommodate himself, when he's trying to, you know, contain himself, trying to, you know, get a foothold, he's coming to the river to fish. And he's very much particular about all the minute details of fishing. And that would be keeping him away. That would be warding up the, um, you know, nightmarish experiences of war. But when he comes to the river, you know, it will be also giving him some sort of uh, spiritual consolation. So you come down again. You know, I am taking some of the text. Like the, the, there is a beautiful, you know, uh, text, postmodernist text, I shall call it. You know, in the 60s, in 1967, yeah, in 1967, I, I'll round up in uh, three, four minutes. In 1967, you know, Richard Brotigan, postmodernist novelist, you know, wrote a beautiful novel called The Trout Fishing in America. Name of the novel is Trout Fishing in America. And if you go through this novel, you shall find it is trout fishing is a character. Trout fishing in America, it is the name of a character. It, like the native names, Dances with Wolves, for example. You know, one example comes to mind. Or Tall Mountain, you know, if you go through some of the native names. And uh, Brotigan, for him, river as a wide, expansive frontier has died. River has lost its you know, power to redeem you. And what is there? Now, there are only splinters. You have your memory of the river that can sustain you. The, the blue, you can see the river in the blue region of the shoal, and that can sustain you that way. And what you find, the territory, the territory of the the space that has sunk and what you have he says that we have the cleveland wrecking yard where everything is on sale you know you have come to such a pass where everything is on sale use trout stream waterfalls birds trees flowers grass Farms are on sale separately with the insects given free. Insects will be given you given to you free with a minimum purchase of 10 feet of stream. Life has come to such a pass with a minimum purchase of 10 feet of stream, you'll be getting the insects free. And all the things you as if you know nature as a you know redeeming agent. 
a nature as a redeeming agent river as a vital redeeming nourishing agent has died and that has you know i bring in deliberately this uh, you know text you know to um, supplement my you know discussion on the oriya text just to see how you know everywhere river ts elia talked about the death of the mythopoeic imagination you know the mermaids are no more there on the river teams and the names are dead departed and um, matthew arnold somewhere was in one of his poems the buried life nal saraswati that river of creative energy that would be sustaining us so when you are talking about the river as a source of inspiration it is not just the ganges it is not just mahanadi it is the river of creative energy that is flowing within each of us to sustain us to give us base to give us anchor and also to make life meaningful thank you so much thank you professor kalidas uh, for this wonderful paper for bringing to us uh, the glimpses of mahanadi through the poets like bhima boy and uh, jayanta mahapatra and shalidas um uh we would take the question answers uh, perhaps after listening to amit kumar ji's paper so please be there and uh, i would now like to invite professor amit kumar uh, pv uh, to present his to present his uh, give his presentation uh, yeah, and let me read his uh, bio note uh, so that we can know a little bit about him so dr amit kumar pv is a professor in the department of comparative literature and india studies at the Indi english and foreign language university hyderabad uh, he is also the director of the finishing school at the same university He has uh, been a uh, Fulbright visiting fellow at uh, Portland State University, Oregon, USA, and uh, his book uh, titled "Bakhtin and Translation Studies: Theoretical Extensions and Connotations," published in 2015, has received a lot of critical acclaim. He has presented his papers in international conferences. and his areas of research uh, include bakhtin studies comparative literary studies translation studies and disability studies and recently he completed a meta project on disability studies in india sponsored by indian council of social sciences research cssr uh, i welcome professor amit kumar pv to uh, give his presentation and uh, now we have uh, actually very little time so i would request him to uh, be in the time limit that is given please uh, professor amit kumar thank you very much uh, professor halka uh, tyagi am i audible am i audible yes sir you are thank you very much uh, i uh, wish to take this opportunity to thank uh, Uh, professor makan pranjpe uh, professor uh, kailash baral and uh, dr azmanara for uh, 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 this uh, beautiful conference let me just uh, i know that i have very little time so let me just uh, jump to my paper and uh, do whatever i can uh, within the limited time that has been given to me uh, the title of the paper is the riddle of the river and uh, i would like to look at uh, the river as a riddle here in the indian situation especially and i have tried to choose three novels for this uh, 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 kind of a representation a uh, representation of the river as a riddle it is like a mystical space in my opinion and uh, i have tried to uh, look into this aspect in some detail 
Uh, let me just go on to the contents of my presentation, understanding the representations of river in the Western knowledge systems. Uh, though we have already talked about it, Professor Kalidash Mishra was also talking about it, Professor Barrel spoke about it. Uh, I would also like to look into some of the important aspects of uh, this uh, uh, Western knowledge systems and the representation of river. Then I will move on to my the crux of my paper, which is river as a haunting spirit in Astrin Tyres, When the River Sleeps, which is a very famous novel, which won the Hindu Prize, etc., etc., so which was at the talk of the town for a very long time. And uh, river as an enigmatic space in Yam Mukundans on the banks of River Mayali. This is a Malayali novel, uh, uh, 1974, but it was translated and uh, it is available in English uh, uh, since 1999. So River is representing anachronistic uh, reality, uh, Sarnath Baran Banerjee's All Quiet in Vikaspuri, which is about uh, the mythical river Saraswati. So we'll talk about that also uh, and the way in which it has been represented. I feel that uh, the three novels that I have chosen uh, uh, represent a, a, a sense of commonality, a sense, a, 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 a common theme runs through. Uh, there is a kind of a connection between all the three novels, and that's what I thought uh, uh, we could uh, juxtapose this to the Western traditions of understanding river. That is what we speak in the concluding observations. Next, uh, understanding representations of river in Western knowledge systems. Uh, how do we understand river in the Western knowledge systems, and how is it different from the way in which we understand rivers in the Indian, uh, so-called India? Uh, I don't know what is India exactly because it's so very diverse and so very vast, but uh, geographical territory that we call India. Uh, river as the cradle of human civilization. Okay, uh, in the West, it has been most of the time seen as cradles of human civilization. That is the way in which knowledge has been constructed around rivers, because those are the cradles of human civilizations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we have a river and royalty. Uh, rivers have been associated with the regality, royalty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The royal Tiber, that is the Roman way of looking at, uh, uh, you know, the Roman river, you know, uh, the Tiber, is always most of the times in literature it is termed as the royal Tiber. So it is a royal uh, kind of an image that is being given as against. Uh, the Indian kind of a situation where divine is, seems to be the central thing in, in when we juxtapose these two things, you know, it is the divinity and a kind of a godliness that is associated here. River as a metaphor for urban expansion in, in the case of uh, industrial revolution and uh, 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 in the case of, sorry, in the case of modernity, uh, due to rationality and reason, etc., etc., river became a frontier and uh, river was seen as a kind of a, you know, a, a border and uh, you should expand as long as the river flows. So Thames became, uh, you know, one of, there are several kinds of articles that uh, tell us that London had to be expanded as long as Thames were there, well, Thames was there, Thames could take us, you know. So that was a kind of a river becomes a metaphor for urban, urbanization, as we know, is a very popular uh, kind of an idea in uh, 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 which comes in the gamut of ideas of modernity. So urbanization, democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is uh, associated with that. So river banks as docklands with colonization, river banks became docklands uh, due to industrial revolution. It became the kind of a dumping space for different kinds of situations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that is another important idea concerning river in the Western scenario. Uh, uh, they become docklands uh, uh, where uh, they become kind of ports and harbors. Okay, next is river expeditions and journey. This is very, very interesting and people have talked about it, uh, the way in which river becomes, uh, 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 provides an opportunity for an Oedipal journey into the mother's womb, you know, a kind of an expeditions and journey. River becomes the space where you want to take a journey. So that is something uh, Marlow of Heart of Darkness of Joseph Conrad is, is, an, ever, uh, is an evergreen example in this context because Marlow is a journey uh, inside the river. So next, uh, let me just move on to my paper where uh, uh, I'm going to talk about Asterin Kairi's uh, novel. This is uh, uh, the great uh, Nagaland novelist, uh, Asterin Kairi's novel, When the River Sleeps, represents sleeping river and uh, 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 as a spirit. Now, the river here is shown as a sleeping river and but unless the river is disturbed, she keeps sleeping. And once she's sleeping, it is it is a uh, uh, she has a lot of hard stones inside her. And then uh, uh, the, the tribal belief is that you jump into the river and you catch hold of that hard stone, and that hard stone will fulfill all the dreams. You know, Kairi foregrounds the beliefs of the tribal population from Nagaland with respect to uh, 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 this river. And the river, this particular novel, brings out different kinds of riverine realities 
different kinds of riverine realities are presented to us, uh, multiple layers of reality, which uh, is extremely interesting and uh, extremely uh, engrossing for uh, uh, people uh, who uh, uh, um, are not aware of such things. Willie is the protagonist here. He's a 48-year-old Agami Angami hunter who is the protagonist in the novel. And uh, Willie uh, has this desire. He's a single man. He lives in a forest. And uh, he belongs to this Angami uh, uh, community. And uh, he has this obsession that he has to explore the sleeping river. And uh, his desire is to catch the heart stone from the bottom of the sleeping river. There is the sleeping river, and then there is this bottom of the sleeping river where you have this heart stone. And once he catches hold of that heart stone, uh, he, his, all his dreams will be fulfilled. This is a kind of a tribal belief. So that is what uh, uh, River as a Haunting Spirit uh, in Astrid and Kire. Uh, in the novel, I'm quoting from the novel here, when the river is asleep, it is completely still, whatever, yet the enchantment of those minutes are uh, sleeping it, uh, when it sleeps, it is, sleeps is so powerful that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. that it turns the stones in the middle of the river bed into a charm. If you can wrest the stone from the heart of the sleeping river and take it home, it will grant you whatever it is empowered to grant you. It could be cattle, women, prowess in war, or success in the hunt. That is what it is meant by catching the river when it is asleep. That way you can make its magic yours, and the retrieved stone is a powerful charm called heart stone. This is a quotation from the text that brings out a kind of a tribal belief that you jump into the river, which is a sleeping river, and then you catch hold of the heart stone. And once you are in possession of that heart stone, uh, you, 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 you have all your dreams fulfilled. You can get them fulfilled. So this is a kind of a way in which you look at, but then it's not so easy because river, let me just go on to the next slide. River nurtures heart stones and uh, uh, that wishes that 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 helps uh, 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 human beings to fulfill their wishes. River is enchanting in its sleep, whereas at the same time it is terrifying in its violence. River can be very very violent, and that is what uh, he uh, encounters. Once he catches hold of the heart stone, river becomes extremely violent. River starts behaving as a spirit. In fact, in the novel there is a chapter called river as a haunting spirit. And that's how I have named this uh, thing as a haunting spirit. River starts behaving like a haunting spirit who attempts to subdue Willie with a frightening attack. It floods and then there is a violence that, that is unleashed and uh, a kind of a different uh, situation happens with Willie when he jumps into the river. River is an abode of the spirit world. There are different spirits that kind of guard the river. And river is being guarded by a battalion of spirit widow women in the novel. In fact, this is just the tip of the iceberg. When we look into the novel in detail, you know, if we find extremely interesting facts about the novel that talk about the river as a very mystical space, you know, it is something it's extremely beautiful and extremely new for, for uh, people who are bred in metropolitan cultures. So river is being guarded by battalion of uh, spirit widow women. The spirit, the one of the important jobs of the spirit widow woman is to uh, 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 is to guard the uh, guard the river, guard the river against any kind of an onslaught. And they chase Willie. Uh, they chase Willie and, and another hunter who comes along with him. They chase him to the uh, border, and then he's there. They, they, they curse, and then they can be very violent. They can eat the flesh of the people who trouble the river. Uh, river is given a kind of a different uh, 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 kind of a, a picture altogether here. So there's a. Uh, uh, a beautiful uh, um, um, review of this. Kairi's English and the narrative choices uh, take back to the oral tradition, thus rejecting the Western model of the great Indian novel. This is how Kairi's novel is different from, you know, Amit Chowdhury's novel or Amitav Ghosh's novel, you know. Uh, so this Kairi is not using a beautiful language, unlike uh, Salman Rushdie or Amitav Ghosh and the kind of a meta-Indian narratives that they provide. Uh, Kairi is actually trying to talk about, she's not at all concerned about language, but her concern is representing you know, a, a, a quiet, almost non-novel kind of a situation about a sleeping river, when the river sleeps. So that is her highlight. This is what uh, the reviewer says, Dipya Jyoti Sarma. I have taken this from this website. Okay, let me move on to the next novel. In a similar line, when we look into uh, On the Banks of Mayali in 1974 by M. Mukundan, one of the stalwarts of Malayalam literature, represents the political struggle of the people of Mahe 
Mahe, as we know, is a French was a French colony, and the river Ma Mayali flows through the town and merges into the sea. Now, the river's journey is symbolic of uh, the way in which a small cultural group gets merged with a larger population. So it is in that sense, it is a very small river that just flows through this town and enters the sea. So the word Mayali refers both to the river as well as the town. So the, the, that's a pun in the way in which uh, Mukundan uses this term Mayali. It is both the river as well as the town. So this is another interesting novel. Uh, I have carefully chosen this because it also pro projects, represents river as an, uh, a kind of a mystical slash enigmatic space. So as it flows through the town, the Mayali brings out uh, uh, divisions between two sets of identities. Uh, the French, the half-French, the Malayalam speakers, the outsiders, the pro-French, the anti-French, pro-India, anti-India protesters, the conservatives, the radicals, the traditionals, traditionalists and the communists. So there's a kind of an interesting divide. The river flows through the town and it seems to be dividing the uh, two sets of people here. And uh, one can identify these different sets of people in this uh, very, very beautiful way. The novel uh, brings out this uh, very interesting division. The novel is written in a very comic tone, though it talks about the struggle of the people of Mahe. It is written in a very ironic and a very comic tone, which makes it very, very interesting and highly readable novel, which I could recommend it to anybody who would like to be, who is interested in uh, some of the South Indian novels. So the river is represented in three significant ways here, if you look at it. First is a romantic space. This is very common. Dasan gazed out of the window. Miley was bathed in warm sunshine. Bells echoed from the church for the evening service and birds flew over the river to their nest. So this is very common. You know, whenever there's a river, we, uh, we cannot miss this kind of a uh, romantic uh, kind of a description about uh, the beauty of the river and the sunset and all that stuff. This is common to students of literature. But what is interesting is the second and the third point here. The second point is uh, river has an esoteric element associated with it, which helps me for foreground argument that it is a mystical space. Uh, to quote from the text, one day as the sun rose from the Mayali River, his, uh, uh, the master's, his awareness of existence suddenly intensified. As the job, joy of being alive entered into him like waves of the sea, he had convulsions and his mouth foamed. Even when he died, his eyes remained open in a ceaseless protest against death. Now, River seems to be concealing the secrets of life and death. River seems to be telling us something which is transcendental. River seems to be talking about something which is paranormal. Yeah? So that kind of an association, several instances like this could also be seen in the text uh, uh, that uh, bring out the possibility of some kind of an esoteric nature, things of esoteric nature. Next, River is associated with magicality too. So rivers start behaving like a catalyst, okay? Like a catalyst. Once a snake had bitten a mapilla boy, the poison had entered the child's head. The only way to get it out was uh, uh, to fetch the snake that had bitten the boy. And that was what Malayalam Kurungan did. Under the spell of the, his magic, the snake swam across the Mayali River, plucked out the poison from the mapilla boy's head and fell dead at Kurungan's feet. So this is a kind of a magical association that we see with the river. So it almost, it acts as a catalyst to magical performances in the text. Anything magical has some connection with the river. So that is another important idea. It provides a kind of a magical aura to the text, which makes me uh, advance my argument that it is a mystical space. Rivers are seen as mystical spaces. So next, uh, magicality and esoteric, esoteric associations are there throughout the text. And uh, there are several narrative instances that demonstrate this. River Mayali is constantly connected with dream and intoxication. So this is something which is very interesting. Uh, river is connected with dream and all the time it uh, advances a parallel reality, a parallel kind of a reality, an alternative reality. Even when the people of Mayali achieve freedom, it appears to them as if they are collectively witnessing a dream. This is very, very hilarious in the novel and uh, they all feel intoxicated and they think that they are still in a dream. Uh, the freedom is a mirage in that sense. The river is represented as bestowed with an enigma, a mysterious charm. So this runs through the text, you know, when we read the text, whenever there is a, a mention of the river, uh, uh, we see that uh, it is associated with a mysterious charm, mysterious charm and an enigma. So next, let me move on to the next novel, the third novel. The river is representing an anachronistic reality. Sarnath Banerjee has a beautiful graphic novel. Uh, it has reviewed a very controversial reviews, uh, interesting and uh, non-interesting reviews also, but it is interesting for me 
because it talks about river saraswati now sarna taranji is a graphic novel all quite in vikas puri which was published in 2015 it's a graphic novel that presents a quest to search the mythical river saraswati now it is a dystopic novel in the sense that we don't know the time it is dystopic it is somewhere in the future and the novel is a political satire about corruption about the kind of a uh, uh, behavior of people uh, nepotism etc etc profit making activity capitalist tendencies and all that stuff and river saraswati is seen as a panacea as as a kind of a, a discovering the river will help solve the problems you know in a very mysterious way river saraswati presents an anachronistic perspective in the novel by emphasizing an ability to solve contemporary problems contemporary that is dystop dystopic contemporary problems so a mythical aura is associated with the river when all the existing rivers and other water resources have dried up everything has been dried up and it is about uh, delhi uh, vikaspuri uh, is a metaphor for delhi and then uh, everything has dried up there and uh, 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 all water resources uh, 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 have have gone uh, uh, blank and bland there so the protagonist is a plumber by the name girish girish and he has lost his job because there is no job for plumbers and he is then sent to find the river deep down below the earth's crust and uh, uh, the political opportunism capitalism water wars and corruption characterized characterized the realism represented in the novel but this is juxtaposed with, with uh, the mystical quality of river saraswati now i am just uh, i have pasted one page of this graphic novel they are trying to find the river there and they just locate the river and there is an organization which this man in the specs called rastogi runs and he is actually running an organization called patal jal anusandhan vikalp patal jal anusandhan vikalp and he is running this organization and, and uh, he says uh, mother of all rivers is saraswati and we should uh, we should actually uh, 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 discover rediscover rather uh, saraswati and he says mata 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 in in that it, it is associated with you know it is as a, as a kind of a elixir of for all the problems that uh, human beings face i'm just putting one page here the that's a very beautiful novel with several such uh, beautiful instances where you know uh, uh, they start digging and then okay the novel is uh, interesting uh, from the standpoint of a mystical understanding because the past is represented as future uh, the past is future because the river uh, saraswati seems to have existed somewhere in the past Uh, somebody was trying to say that it is perennial and rivers are perennial in the indian situation they don't die so something like that is there here the past is future the river or the mythic river saraswati becomes the river of the future so it becomes the river of the future something which was must have been there ages ago becomes the river of the future so there is this kind of an anachronistic possibility which is which i find very very mystical it the rediscovery of the river saraswati is seen as a panacea to conflict to different social and political conflicts saraswati is seen as a perennial river you know it is it is something which will never die and it will at least if even if it dies it is there in the imagination and the imagination digs it out again and again so rastogi is the is the person who is important here as a as a profit making uh, capitalist runs a scientific organization that funds exploring earth's core to search river saraswati calls the river mother of all rivers now that is really very important because a river that doesn't exist or the river that uh, at least we are not aware of uh, is mother of all rivers so that is something which is really very interesting which provides a kind of a mystical quality to this whole exercise next concluding observations now let me just uh, uh, i'm happy i came to the conclusion part indian literatures have represented river a, as a mystical spatial category so this is what i wanted to uh, uh, emphasize indian literatures in various uh, manners uh, have represented rivers as a mystico spatial category there is some kind of a mysticism that's not the oriental kind of a mysticism i disagree with the orientalist understanding of mystical exoticization i'm not talking about that kind of an oriental uh, mystical mysticality but there is a kind of a, a different kind of a mystical spatial category that we see when we talk about rivers rivers in the literary imagination challenge rational thinking and coherent arguments the all the three examples that i gave uh, do not uh, subscribe to rationality so ri- rivers challenge rationality in the indian situation the western understanding as uh, i think uh, professor uh, paranjpe was rightly talking about you know uh, there is something beyond reason so that seems to be there here uh, uh, rational thinking and coherent arguments make no sense so for rivers rivers are never coherent their course is also awesome. sorry respected madam okay rivers provide alternatives to human predicaments by 
for grounding the magical spells and occult possibilities. There are several occult possibilities that rivers foreground, and uh, uh, there are magical spells that they are associated with, and that is what I wanted to foreground and uh, put forth in my paper. Rivers bring forth absurd and ab aberrant occurrences. When we read, when the, when, uh, uh, when the River Sleeps by Astrid and Kire, several possibilities are very absurd and uh, aberrant. I know there is no connection. There, there is a, it, uh, only the only word which can perhaps explain it is absurdity. So the Western word, of course, uh, 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 but uh, if we were to use that to explain the situation, then it is absurdity. So for this reason, I conclude with my title. You know, a present rivers present a perplexing complexity through riddles. You know, one of the important things that uh, one uh, one could see with the, river, the representation of rivers in the Indian situation is that rivers are very closely connected with this notion of a riddle. So rivers present riddles and uh, we, uh, 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 we are asked to uh, kind of understand it and solve it if possible. So with that, I thank you very much for, uh, uh, hope I was audible and I hope uh, uh, I, I, I stuck to the time that was given to me. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amit Kumar. I'm just stepping in for one second to thank both you uh, and uh, the previous speaker, Professor Kalidas Mishra, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Alka Tyagi, for sticking to the time. 5.20 uh, is absolutely brilliant. So now we can open it up, Alka Ji, and uh, if someone has a question or a comment on the earlier, you know, the keynote session papers, you might uh, also pick that up. And... Uh, no, so thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to thank you for uh, you know managing the session so well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kukunjuke, and uh, also to Amit Komarji for a very fluid paper and bringing to us the mystical and uh, esoteric dimensions of the rivers. And he uses that the word absurd perhaps defines these. Uh, situations that the rivers in these narratives present. I, uh, as Professor Paranjapai said, we still have 10 minutes and uh, we can have uh, questions and observations. So kindly just unmute your mic and ask your questions uh, to whomever it is addressed, name them. Uh, excuse me, is Arjuman here? Am I audible? Yes, Am I audible? Are. Uh, I guess there is one more speaker, Alankar Koshik. So is it pushed uh, to today? So Paranjope, shall we take this uh, speaker today or um, and have another link set or uh, do we adjust him tomorrow, sir? Well, my, my initial feeling was that it should be tomorrow. Because you don't want to rush anybody, you know, and... Uh, what happens is after 5.30, maybe people will get a bit impatient. And let's have a proper discussion, you know. So I'm sure we'll be able to adjust uh, the speaker tomorrow. And uh, Ritika ji can do the needful. But I think it's important to, to open up these papers now for discussion rather than, uh, you know, bottle it all up, so to speak, and have one more speaker and uh, then try to rush her. You know, so I think that uh, let us go ahead with the discussion. I think that's crucial. that's crucial and it can go on as long as you like. There is no restriction from our side. It's only on the participant side. And once okay. you notify 5.30 and then if someone wants to go, then it's not fair to keep them, detain them. So please go ahead with the questions. And I think Ritika ji will adjust tomorrow. And tomorrow, because it's not the keynote session, the first session itself can have three speakers, 20 minutes each. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Alkaji. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, so now the floor is open for the questions and observations. And we'll have another link. So if if uh, we are uh, not, we do not have enough time, kindly uh, get on to the link and connect again. So kindly ask your questions now. Uh, I would like to ask the last speaker, one 
uh, question. Yes, I would just like to reflect on one issue. Um, since uh, you also um, give an emphasis on the romantic aspect of uh, the concept of a river, uh, do you think that Tagore laid too much emphasis exclusively on the romantic aspect of a river? Are you talking about Tagore? Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, uh, I am not a scholar on Tagore. I do not know uh, about that. Uh, but of course, whatever I have read, uh, Tagore has been romantic in uh, several respects. Uh, he has actually been trying to talk about uh, 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 the beauty of nature and appreciation of beauty and also associating that with transcendence. So I do not know because I don't have a specific example of Tagore to explain my situation, but since my, it was not part of my paper, actually, Tagore didn't. I, it was not part of your paper. Professor, Professor Kalidas Mishra mentioned Tagore. If anybody else from the panel uh, would like to answer that question, uh, perhaps Professor Mishra, because he mentioned. What I'm saying is the romantic aspect of, the, of a river. Could anybody throw light on that? Well, a uh, romantic aspect of the river is something which is very, very common. I mean, you, uh, you hardly find a poet who doesn't talk about the romanticity of a river. So terrifying. Uh, I think the romantic embraces both. You know, like the siren. You know, I was just uh, going to you know, suggest whether uh, the novelists that he discussed um, in the context of the enchanting aspect of nature and the terrifying aspect, you know, whether there was uh, the image of siren that we get from Greek mythology or, uh, from, you know, the image of Durga and uh, Durga that is both uh, having a Santarupa and a Rudra Rupa, Rudra Rupa. The terrible beauty, you know, Durga in all her uh, terrible aspects, also her calmer aspects. You know, we have different manifestations of the goddess. You know, goddess has uh, very much a quiet, uh, you know, image and also very much a terrible, you know, sight. Uh, so whether uh, the novelist was equating all those images from Greek mythology, from our own mythology, Ganga as a mother, Ganga can also be terrifying, you know. So um, what I would like to suggest is the romantic uh, aspects of a river embraces uh, both. You're... That is my take, you know. True, I agree with you, sir. Ganga herself, uh, in Mahabharata, Ganga is, uh, uh, like, you know, offering her own sons to, to herself into the water body. She puts her own sons to liberate them. And uh, from human perspective, it's a very terrible idea, a mother throwing the sons into the water. But uh, there is a larger, larger romantic ideal there. So I totally agree with you, sir. Uh, while other people ask questions, I was I I was reminded also of this when you talk about romanticism. Even Ravan, in his uh, Shiva Tandava Stotram, he wants to live at the bank of the river in a small cave. This this big king of a glorious city of Sri Lanka wants to live in a small you know, uh, Nikunj at the I, I agree with uh, Professor Kalidash Mishra that uh, uh, the word romanticism has uh, various connotations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the same time, I want to emphasize that uh, 
uh, when we look into the uh, uh, romanticism of the West, uh, we, come we come across a particular kind of romanticism, uh, which is uh, the kind of romanticism that has been canonized. Uh, the, I'm talking about the romantic movement uh, and the five great romantic poets and the kind of things that they were actually talking about. And the thing of beauty is a joy forever and celebration of beauty and they're talking about, uh, you know, uh, peace and serenity and then trying to find peace and, you know, bliss of solitude, etc., etc. In nature, this is a kind of a romanticized, rom romantic understanding and a notion of romantic beauty that has been canonized and that has been celebrated. And uh, the other aspect of romanticism has actually been engulfed by the Western modernity. Uh, where you see, you know, uh, T.S. Eliot trying to say, let us go then you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient, either I stop on the table. Now, the first two lines are uh, traditionally like the romantics, but uh, but later comes the modernist uh, with uh, the terrifying beauty, and uh, it's talking about all has changed, changed utterly, and the terrible beauty is born. So this is a kind of, a, I think there is a distinction with regard to a blemishless kind of a beauty that has been celebrated by the romantics and a kind of a terrifying beauty that has been celebrated, uh, if at all celebrating or they are disillusioned by it, by the Roma by the modernists. So I think there is a distinction that uh, one can make uh, uh, in this regard. That is my take on this. Yes, thank you.